Welcome to University Place Presents. I'm Norman Gilliland, and we're going to call this our Carols of Christmas Past because it's going to be something of a restoration of these familiar tunes uh, to their state as they were, if not originally in all cases, at least long ago. And so some of the titles may not uh, match the tunes that you're going to be hearing today because mm -hmm. uh, that's, in fact, what these things originally sounded like in, uh, if you go mm -hmm. back to the 19th century or even before. We have just the right instrument for that. We'll tell you a little bit about that later. And we have just the right person to guide us through some of these mm. tunes, and that's Trevor Stevenson. Welcome back to University Place Presents. <laughs> Thank you. It's my pleasure. Good. And I, I think, as you said, we are. it is a restoration. And if, if we're doing any sense of a time machine in this, this would probably be the Victorian drawing room and the way that music was made for, through the 19th century and into the early 20th century mostly until the radio really began to push this out. Uh, uh, people made their own music, and the upright piano was, was the, uh, was the cohesion, you know, for this? It, it held the it instrument together. of choice. Yeah, people people gathered around, and uh, again, we'll talk about this this beautiful 1840s instrument when we get there. You know. So, before we hear the yeah. first uh, set, yeah. the first three pieces, yeah. uh, let's get a little bit of background on yeah. them. Uh, starting with one that was, uh, of course, a big, 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 big right. hit for Bing Crosby, <laughs> but uh, that right. is the way it sounded originally. Well, you know, in planning this program, I thought, well, there's there's only one way to avoid having Silent Night at the end of a concert, and that's to have it at the beginning. So, uh, <laughs> right. and, uh, and because you can't put it in the middle, it really doesn't go anywhere. And it's just, uh, and there's a good reason for it. But we're going to we're going to be doing the original Silent Night, the Stille Nacht written by Franz Gruber in 1818 in a little village in Austria. Um, and of all things, many, many years ago, never mind how many, as, as Melville would have said, I was visiting a friend in Austria, and and we were looking at his pianos, and we took a break out the back door. He, he said, here's our village, and he opened the door, and there's a little church. And on the corner of this church, it said, Franz Gruber wrote Silent Night here in 1818 <laughs> in this tiny dwarf in Austria. And, and so I, I, always, I love that everything comes from somewhere. Is that, it, well, yeah, that's so. true. And uh, <laughs> that made a point well taken because yeah. even in Gruber's own time, right. this piece, this yeah. song was so popular that a lot of people thought it was a folk song. Right. He yeah. said, no, yeah. I wrote it in 1818 and it was for a specific purpose. The legend is kind of true about the mice chewing through the bellows of the oh, organ. Yeah. Oh, and so they needed on short order something so, that didn't require oh, the right, organ. Yeah. So it was actually a guitar, the, a guitar and, right. and, a, and a singer or two. Right. But uh, more up-tempo than what we're yeah, used right. to, and it's got this wonderful kind of Austrian Tyrolean lilt to it. It does, right. You can even hear the way that the voices are, 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 are coupled here, the type of writing, there's even a little bit of a sense of yodeling. Yeah, right. In exactly. The, right, I right. know, which is a long way from The Silent Night as as it has become <laughs> yeah. fossilized for yeah, us. Crosby so, does so yeah. little yodeling. So, yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, it's it's very charming. And then we're going to follow that with the old uh, Bring a Torch, Jeanette Isabella. French thought, originally? We're going to do, we're going to mix it up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have one verse in English and then two verses in French. Right, and it's a, uh, and it ends very quietly as as you're you're uh, you know coming to the place where Jesus is born, and please be quiet because don't wake him up. That's that's the gist of the song, you know. And uh, then know. another one where we're used to a certain tune for right. the holly and the ivy, but this isn't that tune. Right. This is the old French tune for the holly and the ivy, and has nothing to do with the the tune that usually appears when you hear the holly and the ivies on the program. Uh, it's much darker. Uh, it's in a minor key. It has fantastic uh, Renaissance chord progressions in it, and, and almost an organ-like style at, uh, at the piano, and also the way the voices create this really tight Renaissance harmony. So it's, it's one of my favorites. Mozart actually wrote a set of variations for violin and, and piano on this very tune as well. Um, so we'll do those three as a starter. You know. And uh, time now to introduce our singers. Then. Yes, I'm so thrilled to work with this vocal quartet on the, on this particular program. And so uh, if they'll come on, we'll introduce them. This is a uh, Margaret Fox, alto, right? Scott Brunsheen is tenor. Jim LaBelle is bass. And Elisa Jordheim will be singing soprano. And uh, again, this is, this is the way it was done before email. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, people gathered around uh, and, and had a great time.
They do sound different, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say refreshingly so. I mean, yeah. Much as we like and are accustomed to the others, this gives a whole new uh, slant on some of these yeah. carols of Christmas past. Right. I always think Silent Night can be quiet but not slow. There you right. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Fast but yeah. silent. Right. And we then, haven't and introduced it, Fred yet. Fred, I know. That, and this piano we do, we call Fred uh, for Frederick Chopin. Uh, and because uh, Frederick Chopin had one of these in his studio, it was one of his favorite instruments. In fact, he, he usually played on an instrument like this throughout his lessons. Uh, he left the student at the Grand and he played all of his examples and he loved this particular type of, of English sound in pianos. And uh, we also know that Chopin had in the studio a piano like this that had this particular type of hammer, which is hollow. That is, the hammers that hit the strings here have no center whatsoever. It's just a wooden ring covered with a few pieces of leather. Um, and uh, so it, it gives it that, that otherworldly sound because there's there's no crunch when the hammer hits the string. It's just a kiss. Uh, and uh, so, and you know, of course you can hear that the, the treble is very gossamer up here like that. And then the bass is, is really, it's soft but quite low sounding. There's a, a great difference in timbre from top to bottom of the instrument, much like the human voice, you know, going from the soprano to the bass register. So the instruments of the 19th century tend to emulate the, those vocal qualities, and you can hear all the other instruments in between, the other singers in between. Also, in this instrument, which is nice with this wonderful light here, you can, you can see that this, this is a carved front. It's not a solid front like many later uprights would be. As uprights got bigger and louder and all that, uh, they started putting just a solid piece of wood in the front to kind of block you from that and, um, tidal wave of sound that was really coming out of there. But in this more delicately voiced instrument, they were very careful to make sure that those strings, like harp-like strings, were uh, accessible to the player. You could get all all the, the, the genies and the fairies in the sound. And so this is a an open front. It's just a carving. And then that is a cloth batten right there. Um, that is, there's just two little thin layers of cloth with some silk curlings stuffed between it like that. And then the sound comes floating through. Um, and also, you know, this, this carve, this carved thing here is one piece. Uh, it's not stamped, it's carved. Uh, and some master and apprentice probably spent some very long, long hours. We, we always say this is pre-email. You much. can't even, if you even have email, you'll never get something like this done. <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, and this instrument has also, it has no metal plate in it. Uh, it's all wood, and that's part of the, the reason that it has that, that incredible warmth of sound. Easier to um, carry, too. What's that? Easier to carry. And it's much too. easier to carry, as <laughs> we found out yesterday. Yes, and uh, so, but it's, uh, but that's, it's all, re its responsiveness is an entirely wooden structure uh, because the strings are lower tension. You don't have to have a massive metal plate in here. Uh, so this is very typical of the English design in the mid 19th century. This instrument's probably about. 1840, something like that. It is an original. It's not one that we have, you know, built from scratch, but one that I have rebuilt twice. And I did all the stringing and the hammer work, and even I made the bass strings over the course of a summer. So, um, anyway, we love Fred. Yeah. <laughs> well, you mentioned yeah. a fairy a little while ago. We'll get to a fairy and uh, a, right. an Arabian too, I think. Right. Uh, well, we'll do them in, in reverse order. We'll start with the hot sands, right, and then move to the colder north. Right? Yes. Yeah. And then, as far as the the fairy is concerned. The yeah. story has the Tchaikovsky uh, having just about finished uh, the Nutcracker mm -hmm. was trying to think of an instrument that would 
apply to the Sugar Plum Ferry, and he right. was just flummoxed, could not come up with right. one. And then somewhere <laughs> in his travels, he heard a Celeste. Right. And th that, so that's it. That's right. it. And while this piano obviously is not a Celeste, that has many of those wonderful, as you say, right. fairy-like qualities. Up, up especially, in this register, yeah, yes. in the upper register. Right. And the Nutcracker is just such an amazing thing. Tchaikovsky, of course, was a great composer for, throughout his career, but the Nutcracker is a late-in-life creation. He is, he's dead yes. within a couple of years of this. Um, it's it's very it's very uh, tightly edited piece. It's a, there's no wasted material in here. He, he never goes on too long. He never you know which sometimes he does in, in the other pieces. Could uh, happen to anyone. It can happen to anyone exactly. And I just I'm just always think it was a great kind of late-in-life gift from him and. And he was a wonderful pianist. He probably wrote the Nutcracker at the piano. And this is these two dances here, the Arabian Dance and the Sugar Plum Fairy, are his published versions of the piano, his piano versions of these dances. They're not transcriptions by somebody else later on. The official uh, so, Chekhov's So you get a, a little bit of a feeling for him sitting down. Yeah.
pieces in this mm -hmm. set, which would seem to have mm -hmm. relatively little to do with each other as they sp mm -hmm. span, they hop, <laughs> they jump a couple <laughs> yeah. of centuries right. among the three of them, and, and what right. ties course, these three together? Trey? Right. I mean, uh, as a musician, of course, they're all tied together by the key, good key relationships. <laughs> is what I, I say, right. right. But um, and of course, you know, the Christmas theme. But the first is Palestrina. This is a, a beautiful Renaissance writing for the voice. Uh, we adore thee. We worship thee uh, for the the baby Jesus. Um, it's followed by a, a 20th century Appalachian carol, I Wonder As I Wander, right? And then that is followed by O Come, Emmanuel, which jumps back into the Gregorian era, right? Um, I think I don't, tied together by by great plain chant tunes, the last two. Even though the Appalachian carol is, is modern, it's still almost like a plain chant type of tune, right? And, sure, and yeah, tied it into an the antique quality. I don't know. I would probably be stretching to really link them together other than they're just pieces that I, I like as a group and so we just you know well let's we say the key way. word is contrast right okay exactly <laughs> right I have to say before we get the, the sugar plum fairy right I always I, when I was a child I wore the record grooves out on that particular piece I was convinced that a human being couldn't have written that piece it was so from another from another a it greater a world yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, I'm still not quite sure how he did it so anyway it was my pleasure to play it on Fred and now we'll go to Palestrina, right? Thank you. 
It does get you uh, into the zone, doesn't know, it? That, right. uh, Emmanuel, whatever it, yeah, I know. modal it's, things are going right. on. It, it, right. I, now I'm listening to it really all glued together, and I, it is, I think, amazingly related to the I wonder as I wonder. <laughs> right? So, anyway, so, I mean, it's it's modal, and it, but it's a similar type of, of melodic species. So, so we're going to say it's unified. Unified, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Contrast and unity. Mm -hmm. uh, familiar uh, title at uh, the Christmas time, and right. it has to do with uh, the, the savior of the heathen right. coming, right. although we usually hear it as a German title. Right, Nun kommt der Heiden Heiland. Yes. Yeah, I know. It has a uh, different spin when you say it in German. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but that's been set by various composers over the years, has it not? Right, um, yeah, and of course, uh, this tune had been around quite a while. We're doing a 17th century version of it, and uh, then, of course, Bach does it several times, uh, and I'm sure dozens of other great uh, German composers as well. Um, it's just a really, the, as you'll hear, I mean, the tune is very, very strong, right? It, um, they could they and and many of these tunes. I don't know if this one had a religious base, but you know many of the tunes in the German chorale tradition uh, of, did not come from religious settings, but came from the taverns and alehouses, right? Well, it's uh, a technique uh, that's still being used today right. by churches. You right. know, bring in the pop twos, bring in the <laughs> you know whatever will bring people into the church. Right. You know, and the, and Martin Luther said, "Why should the devil have all the good tunes?" That's, <laughs> he actually said that. <laughs> so I know. Um, Kudos anyway. to him. Yeah. So, but I, but this one I'm not sure. It, it's probably a plain chant of some sort. Uh, oh, and this is a uh, harmonization uh, by Vulpius of, of a very well known. And then hail and we'll, uh, and Mary, then, Queen of the Heavens. And then we'll go to Lassus, right, which mm -hmm. is just a, a independent four-part writing uh, with, you know, the, everyone has their own line completely. And, and again, it's Ave Maria Cholorum, Hail Mary. Queen of the heavens, queen of the universe, uh, and it has this completely otherworldly sound. So taking us back even further than the generation of Bach. Right, right, and and you'll hear. I mean, it's quite a contrast with the Nun kommt der Heiden Heiland, which is, you know, even though it's about the Savior coming, it's pretty grounded sounding, right? Whereas the Lassus is, you know, is, a little is, more celestial, as you yeah. might expect from the title. Right. So, um, and so we'll do those two as a set. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
<laughs> well, uh, <laughs> the, the, the Christmas season is one in which you, uh, even you, when you sing fairly cheerful, upbeat words, sometimes mm. it's with a right. tune that you would think of as being rather, mm, right. what right. would you say, serious, yeah, to say the least. Yes, de but, deadly serious. But right. beautiful, beautifully right. serious, I guess you would say. Right. So now you have um, three songs having to do with joy. Yes. In particular, coming, coming up, coming, up, yes. up uh -huh. coming soon. Yes. Uh, uh, the the second one, uh, right. ist ein Rose entsprungen, right. you know, about the rose uh, blossoming, right. and the, the tends lineage, yes, usually uh -huh. to have this kind of quiet, uh, very low key joy. Let's say, right? Yeah, I know we're, we're not going to do it springy, but uh -huh. right, yeah, but, but it will have a bloom to it. It's about the blooming of the flower, right? And then and, the, the first one about uh, rejoicing, right? Yeah, as a, and it's a 16th century Leonhard Schroeder. Uh, this is rejoice all Christians, you know. Uh, but again, when you say it in German, somehow it spins out differently. Freut euch, ihr lieben Christen, you know. Uh, I think something about the German language uh, uh, gives a wonderful spin and kind of, maybe it's the consonants that are so crisp and fresh. And we're also doing the, the Lohauer Rose, we're doing it in the original German for the same reason. Um, I think it changes the singing, you know. And then well. another song of joy. And then, an, yeah, another, <laughs> then we have uh, to Oh How Joyfully, which is known as O Sanctis, Yes. Some, uh, sometimes and can be sung in Italian or Latin, uh, and it's a Sicilian hymn, and then a German hymn from the 19th century, but we're doing it in English, right, <laughs> to, to keep everything mixed up. <laughs> keep right? everybody yeah. guessing. Yeah, we're doing it as beautiful Savior mm -hmm. in English, you know. I always want to say, you know, with a, just just harking back a little bit to the lawsuits, you know, there was a time when if you really enjoyed a piece of music, you could not go on YouTube and hear it again. Done by sound. You had to get the parts or something, and... Or have a really good memory. And, and have your sing and slug it out, you know? <laughs> and and but that's the way music was made for so long. There was and I, I there there was just such a beauty to that, you know, and even though it was the hard way. More of a bonding process, maybe. <laughs> right, yes, right. <laughs> a process of discovery, rediscovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyway, I don't, we'll never, we can never go back to that, of course, <laughs> uh, nor probably should we, but uh, but there is, I, I just something, it always sits dear in my heart about, and, and you know, the upright was, was the glue for the family for a long time. Uh, it was even designed for urban family enjoyment. You know, the, the upright was invented to, uh, prevent the floor space from being taken up so that the strings go up the wall instead of eating the room in your small city apartment as people are moving into the cities, you know, so that, all right. But it also gives you this wonderful sense of the sound coming out and people would have been right on it. So anyway. So we'll get a sense of that too. Yeah, so here we go for Freud euch. Das Kindlein ist euch 
<laughs> well, this uh, makes me think, Trevor, that the Victorians certainly mm -hmm. did more than their share to add to the repertory of hymns and Christmas carols. Yes, right. Yes, uh, quite a bit. Well, and, and you know, of course, some people argue the Victorians invented Christmas, which well, of course is right. a stretch. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, Victoria, and maybe Mary, and Dickens single-handedly. Yeah, no, sure. no, no, but no, but they did. They they were very inspired by Christmas, and they, they really took it to heart. And and I think you know they they crafted a lot of the the familial feeling that we have with Christmas uh, that that was partly their invention so um, yeah and that last one was written you know in the 1840s and has uh, and Felix Mendelssohn didn't write that piece but his 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 spirit is is in those harmonies <laughs> as, as well very very um, true well under these next four we can credit I think pretty solidly to the Victorians right the, the the first one is by Charles Ives written around 1920 uh, uh, but yet yeah, but in a Victorian sensibility uh, and you know Ives was in a very emotional man, uh, good, and well, you know, he was he yes. was uh, you know at one moment you know uh, railing at at, at at government's faults and 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 airplanes. He hated airplanes every time they flew over, right? And in another moment, he was sobbing huge tears over a little flower or whatever. You know, I mean, he was a really cranked up person. But <laughs> but but like Van Gogh, he was an ecstatic. You know, and and uh, and uh, he catches something in this little one-page Christmas carol. He calls it uh, um, that, that. There's some kind of like regret in it uh, that you can never really, you can't live up to what it's all about. Um, and uh, so anyway, it's 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 in his 120. One songs that he published, and uh, we're we're thrilled to be doing it. And then we're going to move very on familiar one. from that to "O Little Town of Bethlehem," uh, which is also 19th century. Uh, uh, and then uh, for you know our, the American uh, in as a uh, the uh, I heard the bells on Christmas Day is written by the words are written by Longfellow during the Civil War, uh, uh, in 1863, uh, and it's about it's about war and how and it's about how. Peace is always being pushed out, uh, and it, it's about really the struggle between war and peace, and, and it comes out on the positive side, but it's really quite in it's, doubt. It's pro peace. Uh, uh, despair gets a big say. In well, this speaking one. of the Civil yeah. War, yeah. then this uh, last one is going to be. Well, very familiar by title, but it's going to sound right. a little different from what you're used to because this is the way it originally right. was written. Was actually written by a former uh, Confederate uh, <laughs> clerk. Right. Who was, um, but written before the war, though. I yes, think it's right. It says right. Jay Pierpont, right? Yes. As, and so if that name sounds kind of familiar, it's because he was the uncle of J.P. Morgan, right. a financier. So he had some kind of interesting right. connections. Uh, Pierpont did. But of course, the beauty is it's a southerner writing a piece about the snow, and it's the one horse <laughs> open sleigh, and it's the jingle bells, uh, and the 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 verse is similar to what we know but that a little chorus. bit. But the chorus is completely different from what has come catchy, down to though. it, uh, and very catchy yeah. and beautifully set for a four part harmony, uh, and just uh, and the piano part that goes wild and turns into kind of a, there's a, like a barroom piano riff at the end of everything. <laughs> it is that I'm not making it up. It's what's written, you know. I mean, and it's it's. Pass the Warner. eggnog. Pass the eggnog, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, anyway, it's, it, I, it, it really Ives changed my life to hear it. Yeah. Ives and three Victorians. Yes. <laughs> Little child of Bethlehem 
Just say a little bit about keys in the Victorian era. Uh, uh, 
they generally tuned in an unequal fashion. Uh, they still harken back to the 18th century where keys like C major had serenity and stillness, keys closer to the top of the circle of fifths, G major, D major, the commonly used keys. The keys at the bottom of the circle of fifths, like A flat, like the piece we were just in, um, in the tuning itself had more vibrato built right into the sound. It was, so here's A flat. It's a and that's the jingle bells right there, right? Whereas C, here C is low blood pressure, right? Like that, right? Like that. So, you know, they could write loud and see if they wanted to, but but these colors were at their disposal. Everyone understood them. And it's not a coincidence that the one horse opus sleigh is written in that that very buzzy key of A flat, and that the 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 solo that Scott sang, the Ives, was written in F which is a pastoral key and is a very smooth key like that, the little star of Bethlehem. So um, this is a whole uh, code that was understood right up until about 1920. Uh, and we have the vestiges of it. We understand that these keys had associations, but we didn't know uh, until pretty recently that it was actually put into practice for hundreds of years uh, with the tuning hammer <laughs> at the piano by the musicians and by the technicians as well. So I just wanted to point that out because it's a, it's a great, moment uh, for, to hear the contrast between those keys. A lot of fun and the trouble, though, with the uh, barroom. Oh, part. I know. <laughs> I always feel like I should have my beer right here. You well, know. We'll that for next time for the sequel. Handy, right. <laughs> well, so. if there's any white composer who contributed, uh, his share and then some right. good deal to the Christmas repertory, it would be Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach, right. And we're going to end with uh, four songs that uh, that he harmonized, uh, and, and then finally a chorale, which he, which he also inherited, and then harmonized. Um, somewhere in Bach's life, I can't remember the exact year that he was asked by another musician friend of his, whose last name was Shameli, right, to um, harmonize a set of about... 50 or so spiritual songs. They were putting together kind of like a Reader's Digest <laughs> of the day, a uh, book of, of, of pieces that people could, uh, you know, take in and have like a devotional time with. And they were organized by subject. There were Easter pieces, Christmas pieces, uh, pieces for hope, you know, pieces to help you out of despair or whatever. Uh, and uh, so, and these are for the, the Christmas ones that we're going to do here. Uh, and the tunes, again, Bach probably inherited these. He might have written a few of the tunes, uh, but the harmonizations, what I'm playing in the keyboard part, those are his his masterful mm -hmm. ideas of ways to harmonize uh, these these great tunes that he had. I think it gives you a chance when you hear the tune and then what's underneath it to, to maybe hear what Bach heard when he heard somebody singing a melody. He could hear all mm -hmm. the infinite possibilities that were being generated by that melody, and they, and they come out in the, basically the continuo part where, where I, I'm at. Here. So we're going to do the first one, uh, which is, oh, uh, oh, baby Jesus, uh, sweet, oh, baby Jesus, mild, uh, your father's will you have fulfilled. You've come to earth uh, to save us all. You've st and also you've stilled your father's anger. Uh, it's a you know an interesting sentiment, the, uh, uh, but yeah, but that, I mean that's that's where they're coming from. And then the second one uh, will be sung. That is in we'll do that in unison. And then uh, Margaret will sing as a, an alto solo the the kind of pick yourself up. Uh, it's Christmas season uh, feeling. Uh, uh, rise up, O oh heart, uh, and and uh, have joy for this season. Then then after that we'll do uh, a a uh, this is a soprano solo uh, and I. The soprano is singing how she will be standing at the cradle to watch over the baby Jesus. This is a, a, a very typical 18th century German sentiment that, that you the parishioner, the person singing, becomes involved in the action. It's all over the box, the passions and things like that. So, so you're, you're not just thinking about what happened hundreds of years ago, you're participating in it. Um, and so it's in the first person and it's, it's active. And so you're helping care for the baby Jesus. Uh, and then the, the last one is uh, a tenor solo. Uh, uh, and, uh, most interestingly about this one uh, is it's a complete French minuet, right? It's uh, the you know in in Germany in the 18th century the the highest style you could attain was to be French. Oh yes, you know <laughs> all how things Europe changed, <laughs> right? You know, but nevertheless, right, and, and at fancy courts uh, uh, they spoke French. Uh, it, the German court spoke French. Frederick the Great at court spoke only French, uh, and and everybody else did too if they wanted to keep their head. So uh, so anyway, this is in the uh, the high 
high French style, uh, this minuet. And then we'll close with a, 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 a chorale that uh, is actually the closing chorale in Bach's cantata number one, How Brightly Shines the Morning Star. Uh, uh, Nikolai had originally uh, created this tune, and Bach uh, uh, did a wonderful harmonization of it here. Uh, and so we'll end, we'll end with that. Ich deine Güte.
Norman Gilliland, I hope you've enjoyed Carols of Christmas Past and that you'll join me next time around for University Place Presents. <laughs>